like to say thank you for coming on and talking talking to us about this. Sure. Uh, I used to be a I used to run an IT department for uh, a small business and a few small businesses with on premise exchange service. So uh, it really piqued my interest when this vulnerability came up. But uh, I don't I don't really know a lot about it. Do you think you could just give us a bit of an overview of the situation and what's happened? I can give you a, an overview as far as the specifics. The articles at the bottom of my experts exchange article, they're growing all the time as far as the number of links and that. There's there's four folks out there who are far more knowledgeable about the specific details of, uh, of the vulnerability. But in exchange 13, 16, and 19, we have a series of four vulnerabilities that folks can take advantage of one step, two step, three step, four step to from outside access to system. So basically running as system, which you know what that means. Yeah. One of the first things that seems to be done is the LSAS service gets dumped, which means any passwords that may be sitting in memory are now out there, which could be your system, system uh, services on the exchange server itself, or, or if you've got an exchange admin, that kind of thing that's logged in recently. So that immediately places the, the need to reset all passwords across the board and, and more. So that's that, that's pretty much it. And that's or, interesting, well, isn't it? it. Because, because people will often, I'll be, I was very guilty of it, using similar passwords with administrators across their whole system. And, you know, you get uh, vulnerabilities like that. It, it can mean, you know, not just loss of, data access or data to your email, but your whole file system and essentially your whole business. Is that correct? It depends on how far the perpetrators, and I'll shorten that to perps, it depends on how far the perps get in yeah. and how much time they've spent. There's a lot of folks out there that we know of that just have the um, some feelers as far as looking for. And then there's others we know of that have the web shells that were dropped in, so the aspects dot aspects files that were dropped into either CI NetPub or other locations, but there's no other signs per se of compromise. So there's no Trojans dropped in, there's no uh, software apparently that's been put in there. So it seems to vary. There's lots mm -hmm. of theories as far as the why, as far as uh, what the folks were up to. And now apparently there's quite a few different groups, if you will, that are working on it or working on uh, grabbing what they can or getting in what where they can as far as on-premises exchange. Yeah, so you, you may not really know if you're compromised or not. Oh no, it's obvious. It is. The yeah. Microsoft released a, a PowerShell. Uh, there, It's now called test logon deploy or something like that. But there's a link again in the article as well as the, the, um, the PowerShell. And it will run through all the various elements logs, et cetera, to examine the Exchange server to see if there are issues or things that need to be looked at or addressed. Oh, no, that's great, because we'll probably have quite a few people that uh, might, like myself, that were running IT departments, not really knowing the ins and outs of Exchange. So they'd be able to pick up a script and be able to run something to tell you where, you know, where the vulnerabilities are is a, is a, is a great step for those, for those people that don't really have the know-how. Um, yep. So what, what other things can like small businesses do, uh, maybe like those ones with small IT departments, quickly do you know, to mitigate the risk? The well, first the first step? thing is patch, obviously. <laughs> uh, there are some mitigation steps that Microsoft released after the fact where you can disable various virtual directories within the Exchange server itself. You can close 443 HTTPS port forward in the meantime, yeah. uh, but primarily get from Exchange 13, 16, and 19, or in Exchange 13, 16, and 19, get the latest CU on there, cumulative update, and then get the security patch on there. Obviously, backups are important. So there should be a good known good backups in place. So if the server is compromised, you can backstep to before the, the, the compromise date, which is usually in the aspects files creation date. So you backstep your, your Exchange server. If you've done best practices, where you've got your operating system on a partition, your exchange files in a partition, then your logs and databases on their own partitions. And the only thing you have to restore is the OS and the exchange files themselves. 
And then you can do what's called a forklift. That's in the PowerShell for that is in uh, the article, or my EE article. And then you go and see you, then you go and do your security update. That, and obviously in the process, uh, watching all of the, or looking into all of the Active Directory accounts and that, there's some PowerShell scripts in place also in the article to have a look and see if there's new accounts created, what what uh, members of domain admins, schema admins, enterprise admins, et cetera. So there's a number of different PowerShell scripts also in the article that can help you figure out what's going on, where it's going on, as well as local admin groups on every computer object in Active Directory. So there, there's some ways to, to gather some intelligence. The other thing is, is your edge device. Hopefully you're running a corporate enterprise level. So Sonic Wall, Palo Alto, uh, FortiGate, and uh, have a security subscription in place. The intrusion protection services that are run on, run on the edge are, have been from what we've seen about March 2nd or thereabouts, most edge devices with security IPS intrusion protection have been blocking any probes or any attacks uh, from the edge. So they don't even get to the exchange. That doesn't mitigate what may already be there because the first sign seemed to be the last week of February. So that would be that. Mm, and that's, so that's your firewalls and things that- uh, That's that correct. Level. Yeah. That's correct. Now, with this, does this affect older systems? So like with some people that might be running older exchange service than 13? Exchange 10, 2010 does have a patch for one of the four. The other three, it is not vulnerable for. And from what we're seeing so far, it's the low hanging fruits so of 13, 16 and 19 that are being picked on. 2010 takes uh, local, I think it's admin access or the, it takes a foothold on the internal network already to exploit. So that's relatively a moot point. Yeah, no, that's good to know. And anyone who's upgrading to, to these new ones, the, the patch, is that included? already uh, no. in any new systems, no. So you would still, if you were installing any of, you know, Exchange 13, 16 or 19 today, you'd need to make sure that you have the, the patch ready to you'd go. Be that's correct. You'd be installing using the latest cumulative update because it's, it's autonomous. Each update is actually a reinstall of Exchange server. Then applying the security patch, then you can use, there's a, a Microsoft tool to test from the outside to make sure the vulner there's no vulnerabilities present and you're good to go. Oh, that sounds really good. And now uh, you've also written this article, we've mentioned it a few times, we'll include it uh, in part of uh, the documentation with this video, but um, you cover quite a lot of good points about the the vulnerability itself. And, and, and like you said, there's some scripts there. So uh, they're very good uh, things to be able to have access to. I think um, with, you know, with Expert Exchange, you've been able to bring it all together. You're not trying to find bits and pieces on the internet. So everyone have a look out for, for Philip's article. Um, yeah, that's basically why it's there. Uh, I've thought about putting a blog post on our own, uh, our own blog as well. At some point that'll happen, but time constraints, we've got projects that have been put on hold because we've been scrambling. Not only, we took care of our clients right away. Uh, it was a two day process almost straight through. And then since then we've been helping out with folks who are in a jam. They look signs of compromise. What do I do? How do I do, do a forklift uh, restore that kind of thing? So uh, that's taken a fairly significant amount of time over the last week as well making sure that folks are helped that need to be helped. Yeah, I'm sure you've had quite a few phone calls from clients going, what do I do? And well, we sent out an email. Fun. Yeah, we yeah. sent out a, a broadcast email right away, letting folks know their, their mail server is going down and it's going down pronto uh, as far as getting it patched and making sure it's secure. Mm. And is there is there any uh, issue with people like uh, that, that don't have that help? Is there somewhere where they can, they can get the help, maybe they're a, they're a small business that just employ IT from time to time, um, that kind of thing. Is there somewhere that they can, can go and get the professional help like that? Um, we're a rare breed I'm finding. I, those of us that still work, Michael B is one of the experts that uh, I've also referenced in, in the article. He's put some pretty good points up. Um, he's, vastly superior as far as his exchange abilities go compared to myself. There are a few of us around. We, I, I'm a former small business server MVP. So I've been working with it since back office days. So exchange for 
I think it was Exchange 4.0 or 5.0. It might be Exchange 5.0 and then 5.5. And my modus operandi, if you will, was SPS was a perfect, this is how you do it by Microsoft. So I tore it apart and put it back together many, 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 many times to, to figure that out. So that's where the Exchange background comes from for myself. Yeah. If you still have Exchange on premises and nobody to help you with it, then there's two questions you got to ask yourself. If there's nobody locally or regionally, or you don't really need even nationally, uh, you don't really need somebody local. As long as that person is competent, knows what they're doing, has been working with Exchange for a long time, can demonstrate that competence in some way, shape or form. So blog posts or uh, help on forums and that kind of thing, then the cloud is probably the way to go. But if you do have somebody who can help you out, I know the number one reason why our clients are all on premises. Well, there's a few reasons, but one of them is the data is where they can see it. And then there's this, there's enough to grab if something breaks or doesn't work or, or something along those lines. And they can uh, reach out and say, hey, something's not working. Or well, in our case, it's rare that things break in, the, in exchange, very rare. So that's pr the primary reason, then it's a fixed cost. And it's not very expensive to run the solution over five years. Yeah, I mean, you, you um, and imagine you probably get people wanting to move to the cloud and you'd, you'd uh, challenge their ideas somewhat, sometimes with uh, one way or another. It, it becomes a matter of, is it the right fit? Now, like I said, there's a, there's a type of organization that just doesn't have the ability to get the right kind of IT help. And they're the ones that uh, would primarily benefit for ha from having their, their uh, services in the cloud. That being said, the cloud has its issues. So there's, there's no perfect system as much as folks are saying, oh, on-premises exchange is evil, blah, blah, blah right now. The reality is, is that um, Office 365 has experienced plenty of downtime over the last year, Azure, AWS. Um, there's plenty of third-party cloud services that have gone poof because they got encrypted and didn't have a proper segmentation and network architecture. Uh, huge companies. So that it's ultimately, it's the human that needs to be trained and that's the end user. Because everybody absentmindedly, absentmindedly clicks on something, and you can only have the best security, intrusion protection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that ain't going to help you when somebody clicks on something. That's so, right. You can't protect against being human, can you? <laughs> that's ultimately when you look at the chain of events from start to finish, it don't matter how good your security it is. It doesn't matter if you're on premises, in the cloud, somebody clicks on something, you're hooped. Yes. Bada bing, yeah. bada boom. Yeah. Done. <laughs> Been there, done that quite a few times too. Yes, I know sir. What you mean. Um, and now, is it you, you mentioned Michael B? Is there any other experts that uh, people could reach out to uh, in your area that you'd, you'd recommend, and especially on Experts Exchange? You know, we've got quite a uh, breadth of, of people there. Um, there, yeah, I'm right now. Michael B is probably the first line that I've seen on Experts Exchange. Uh, there is uh, Dave Shackelford is a, an Exchange MVP, former Exchange MVP who I'm friends with. He's also somebody that uh, you can just do a quick search for Dave Shackelford and he turns up all over the place. Very, very competent, very smart individual. Those are, I when I run into a, a problem of some sort, it's either Michael or Dave that gets a question from myself. So those would be the two. Um, off the top, I can't think of anybody else on Experts Exchange. There's a few users, but I haven't seen them around for, for a while on various exchange-related questions on the, and, on the forum. Um, and of course, there's always yourself. So you're always uh, contributing lot, quite a lot, So which we thank you for. It's, uh, it's a great, no, I, great I, to have you there. Well, it's, you're very welcome. It's, uh, sharing knowledge is, a, I realized at some point uh, way back in the day that I needed to share my knowledge because at some point I'm not going to be here and that knowledge goes away with me. So I thought, well, let's do that. So I started the blog more for my own because this was getting full. So everything was falling off the shelf when the new stuff was coming in from this way, right? So the, that's the, the motivator for the blog and then all the knowledge base and that. But eventually it was like, okay, I got to really help because a lot of people were reaching, reaching out as a result of the knowledge that was uh, publicly facing or is publicly facing. So that, mm -hmm. I got involved with Experts Exchange quite a long time ago. 
and a few other forums. Actually, all the forums I've participated in over the years, I'm still on EE um, because there's a, a small cache of really solid questions. People who are, are open to suggestion, open to guidance, and I get to share a little bit of knowledge in the process. Yeah, and and that's the great part about it, isn't it? You can you can go back and forth. You can learn. Other people can learn, and you know, and and also like exchange is is one of our biggest topics. It's got a, quite a lot of content. We get a lot of questions coming through. Uh, across some great articles from like like from yourself. Uh, so it is a really good resource for something that could be quite hard to get into unless you actually have a something like an on-site premise or uh, or you're versed in. In, in the cloud side of things, um, really, it's a great way to to get in and learn uh, all about how Exchange works, isn't it? Yeah, setting Exchange up uh, in in the PowerShell steps is uh, the biggest thing. Is waiting for it to install. Once it's installed, the post install steps. There's probably a dozen PowerShell steps, and that's it. Mm. Exchange is really, really, really easy to 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 install. It's really hard to migrate. And I don't say really hard. If you look at migrating a domain controller as an example, you've got your Active Directory, you've got DNS, you've got DHCP, and any other custom type customizations that you have to migrate from one to the other. The exchange migration, as long as it's not customized, can be pretty straightforward. But again, coming back to the small business server side of things, that's we've had some really fancy ways of, of working with Exchange. So we really had to get into the nuts and bolts of it because Small Business Server was a very unique beast as far as Microsoft putting it all on one server. So yeah. of course, well, it's very a easy to controller. use. I, I might add, it was very easy to use for the layman IT. Yep. Use the my, wizards. Yep. Use the wizards. And the, <laughs> and the benefit of, of the wizards, though, if you go back in the history of Small Business Server, 2003 was supposed to be the cat's meow, and it was. It blew yes. Microsoft away as far as sales went. They, they weren't expecting what happened with 03 and then the community that built up around it. But the big thing that uh, was learned there was wizards. And the wizards that were finessed, if you will, in, in Small Business Server 2003 made their way into all the other areas of Windows Server and all other areas of different various uh, products that Microsoft has been building over the last decade or two. Then on top of that, the best practices analyzers that were built for SPS made their way into Windows Server. So you could check your ADE, you could check your DNS, you could check all of the roles and services, RRS, you name it. You could run a, an analyzer and it'll go, hey, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine th things that you need to do, exchange. You've got five different things that you need to tweak to make this work. Or you've got some old legacy stuff that you didn't delete or clean out when you migrated from two versions ago. That That's one of the benefits, I think. Not my, in my not so humble opinion as a former S, SPS MVP, but that's one of, the, one of the two big benefits or yeah, one big I, benefit, if you will. No doubt. Yeah. Anything that can help you point you in the right direction is always a good thing. Um, yep. Yeah. Look, thank you for coming on today. Uh, You're we'll, welcome. We'll certainly get your article out there as soon as possible. This is obviously something affecting a lot of people. Uh, yep. We'll... Yeah, we'll certainly be in contact, but I can't thank you enough for just sharing your knowledge again here and, and on site. Uh, and everyone have a look out for Philip on, on Experts Exchange. So thank you again. You're very welcome. Not a problem. And apologies all for the blurry camera. At some point, I got to break down and actually buy a new one. It does not <laughs> want to focus. So I'm not quite a marshmallow. I actually am clear in real life. No, that's good to, good to know. And good you're not that close to the bears either. Uh, I've got stories about that one too, from Kodiaks to a couple of brown bears. And yeah, the closest I think I could reach out and touch him, he was in a bush. <laughs> oh, gee, that's. that's I think I scared him more than there. he scared me, but uh, he was the one that ran away. I was the one that probably, you know, had to uh, take care of changing my clothes. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again, and uh, we'll talk soon. You're welcome. Y'all have a good one. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, stay too. safe. Yeah, you stay safe. Thanks, Philip.